thank you very much uh, again for having me and for that very kind introduction, uh, Joel. So uh, today I'm, I have, I'm scheduled for a talk today and then a hands-on session tomorrow afternoon and then again a talk on Wednesday. And so what I wanted to do today was actually talk a little bit about a piece of, uh, this piece of software that Joel has mentioned uh, called YT, which is you know, an analysis and visualization uh, toolkit that, that I've been working on. Um, and also, you know, give sort of a, a uh, an overview of, of why it was developed and what its goals are, and also try to get it so that by the uh, the hands-on session tomorrow we can actually start analyzing data. And uh, I have a, a couple different data sets on uh, SDSC's Gordon already uh, that we can take a look at uh, tomorrow afternoon. So this is kind of an overview and an introduction, but it's not. Uh, uh, it's it's more. Uh, it's, I'm sorry, it's less abstract than, uh, than you might have uh, expected. So let's start out with the prompt here, which is there's only one sky, and so there's only one nature that we can observe, uh, but there are many different simulation codes. And so when I say that, what I mean is that, you know, there's, there are simulation codes that study particles, uh, you know, that, that have the dark matter discretized as particles. There are simulation codes that also include fluids that are discretized as particles. There are simulation codes that have fluids discretized as, say, a moving mesh, or as a fixed grid, or as an adaptive grid, and on and on and on. And all these different codes typically have uh, had their own specific mechanisms of analysis uh, developed for them and then applied. And so what ends up happening uh, really is, you know, so this is, this is an image of a ziggurat. And the idea here is that uh, there's this legend of people who all spoke the same language and they built a tower to heaven. And so the problem that, uh, that, that I wanted to solve with, with this piece of software was sort of the inverse. No one was speaking the same language, although we were all independently trying to, to reach the heavens. Oh, I know. Uh, <laughs> so that's where it breaks down. Uh, but thank you, Darren. Uh, so uh, typically, you know, we use different data data structures, different methods for, for, say, watching the way that the fluid evolves, different assumptions about the way, about the way that fluid behaves, uh, dif uh, or the way that stars behave, or the way that, you know, say, galaxies interact with their environment, different I.O. methods. So the way that a simulation code talks to a disk could be completely different. You might be streaming bytes uh, directly to disk. You might be using something like HDF5. You might be writing to a database, or you might not write anything at all. Uh, all these different things have different units, different variable names. And so it's this great diaspora of uh, simulation codes and the way that they, that they all try to you know, describe the way that nature actually builds galaxies and stars and galaxy clusters. And so really uh, what we want to do is we want to compare apples to apples, but instead are left comparing apples to pineapples in many different uh, situations. They have the same root word in them, apple, but typically they taste different, they look different, and it's difficult to, to make sure that we, are, that we are talking about the same things. So this brings us to the topic of analysis. Uh, and the, the piece of software that I'm going to describe called YT, uh, you can find it at yt-project.org, and there's an AstroPH paper that uh, goes into some detail on the methods, or at least the state of the methods as they were in uh, late 2010. Um, since that time, there have been a number of improvements uh, to the code and to the way that it, uh, to the to the number of contributors as well. Uh, you know, we have a website. Uh, we've got documentation, source code. All these things are available, uh, you know, online. And in fact, it comes with an install script so that you can install it onto your laptop, onto a supercomputing cluster. You can install it anywhere. And what it will do when you run the install script is it goes out, it downloads the full dependency stack, downloads the source code downloads a development environment, builds this, comes with a GUI, and even sample data. And so it's, complete, it's a full bootstrap to get you up and running analyzing simulation data. Uh, from a, a philosophical standpoint, it's been designed to address physical rather than computational entities. And so this is a problem that uh, many of us run into when we deal with simulation codes. For instance, most of my work has been with the simulation code ENZO. ENZO is an adaptive mesh refinement code. What that means is that it has a full domain that's discretized into, into cells. And so there's this, this background that has all these cells. And then if a cell is flagged as being interesting, for instance, it's over dense or it's the point of a shock or, or something, uh, and 
an additional level of refinement. So cells that are you know, higher resolution get inserted so that we can ensure that we have accurate solution to our simulation problem, or to our simulation problem at all spatial locations and at all times. And so what ends up happening when you start thinking about ENSO data sets is you start thinking about grids on disk. So you end up with, uh, instead of thinking about the way that uh, galaxies form, and so here we have uh, an example of an ENSO data set. Well, and each of these little blobs is a portion of a galaxy or a filament or something. Uh, but then on top of them, I've overlaid an uh, image of where all the different grids are in the simulation. We don't want to be thinking about where grids are on disk or in the simulation. As astronomers, what we want to do is we want to think about the way that galaxies form. We want to think about galaxies, we want to think about stars, GMCs, and so on, rather than having to deal with the fact that these are all in discretized HDF5 files that are written on disk in some format, striped on luster, on and on and on. And so YT undergoes this process of, uh, of reading in data from disk, correlating it uh, with other data, you know, applying some sort of process to it, and then visualizing it. And so this can be thought of in a couple different ways. For instance, if you were, uh, say, looking for halos in a cosmological simulation, it would go out, it would read the particles from disk, it would correlate the spatial locations of those particles across, uh, you know, across grids, across uh, filaments, across galaxy clusters, and so on. It would then identify the halos in this processing step, and then it could return to a visualization, either a quantitative visualization, such as a, a reduced data table set, or it could be a, you know, a 3D visualization, or a two-dimensional visualization on top of which uh, halos have been plotted. And so the idea being, basically, the universe is full of gas, dark matter, and stars, and we try to make it easy to access that material. Uh, what this includes is includes uh, I.O., uh, masking of overlapping data, loading data on demand, geometric and non-geometric uh, selection, field generation, and common interfaces to different data types. And so I've listed here a couple of the different codes that YT supports. Uh, specifically, uh, Enzo, Orion, Castro, and Flash are the four codes that we have the, the most support for. So Enzo is an adaptive mesh refinement uh, code that was originally developed at the Laboratory of Computational Astrophysics uh, by Greg Bryan with Mike Norman uh, some time ago. It's now, you know, it's a community code that's available. Orion is a code developed at uh, uh, University of California, Berkeley. It's primarily used for star formation simulations where it's, you know, been applied with great success to things like uh, GMCs and so on. Uh, Castro is, is, uh, is more properly now known as Nix, which is a cosmological code that shares some heritage with Orion that's uh, being developed at Lawrence Berkeley Labs. Flash, uh, as many of you may know, is developed at the University of Chicago uh, ASC Flash, cent or Flash Center, and it's been applied to a number of different domains, cosmology, galaxy clusters, uh, thermonuclear blasts, you know, uh, supernova, on and on and on. Now, all of those codes actually share something in common, and that's that they are uh, adaptive mesh refinement codes that basically operate on patch-based uh, patch refinement. In, our, in the second category, uh, we also support Chombo, Tiger, Athena, Art, and Ramses. And Art and Ramses are both octree codes. They operate similar to uh, patch-based uh, AMR codes. They are AMR codes. And they operate similarly, except instead of identifying grid patches, you know, collections of cells uh, in a given region, they actually uh, refine cell by cell. Uh, Chris Moody, who's in the audience here, uh, actually worked very hard on the Art support in YT. Uh, and it's uh, impressive. So. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> um, uh, and the idea is to you know, create a lingua franca for astrophysical codes. Now, enough of, enough of the, the broad scale stuff. And instead, I want to share a couple of the things that you can do, uh, which are essentially different ways of formulating questions. And so when we ask a question in astrophysics, that's really, uh, for me at least, one of the harder parts, is to come up with an interesting question to ask of our data. Once you figure out the question, figuring out how to answer it can be a little bit easier. And so what we want to do is we want to make it easier to do that uh, with YT. And so YT is written in Python with a number of operations written in C, Cython, uh, Fortran, and JavaScript, actually. Uh, so we have a number of different things, a uh, number of different fast numerical backends on top of which we apply a large, you know, a, a large Python code base that makes them easy to access. Uh, 
So essentially, we, or so we access objects such as orthogonal rays, non-orthogonal rays, slices, oblique slices, and projections. And I'll go into to a little bit more detail about what you can do with these. Uh, but really, the interesting stuff for me comes in with the selection of 3D objects. And so when you have a simulation domain, uh, let's say that you want to take a look at the way the, uh, the, way the gas is flowing inside a galaxy. You could ask, uh, well, I want to look at the entire domain and then figure out which parts are in the galaxy, so on and so forth. Or you could, for instance, identify a sphere in which you want to examine the data, or a cylinder, or you know, some sort of a disk object. And so these are, these are accessible to you uh, from within the code. And in fact, they all respect a unified interface. And so this is a, a YT script that examines the way that data, or the, the density between two different points in a simulation. So this is a full Python script that you could actually type uh, on Gordon uh, if, you had a, if you had a login or if you had sample data. And I'm going to go through it very briefly. And the first part is just you know, importing everything into, into your Python namespace. Uh, moving on from that, we load up the data set, and then we set the start and the stop points of the ray. And then when we query that ray for density, what it does is it actually goes out, it identifies all the different data regions that uh, intersect that ray, and then it steps over each one individually, returning to you the value of density at that point. And the same thing can be done of slices, where we say that we want to slice along the zeroth axis at coordinate 0 0.5, and it respects the same interface. And finally, with spheres as well. You can say that you want a sphere that's a 100 AU in radius, centered at the maximum density point. It will go out, it will read the data for you, and then return that data to you. And so in doing this, it removes from the equation completely all of the processes that, that are typically rote maneuvers that uh, as, as astro astronomers we shouldn't have to deal with. Things like opening data files, figuring out where files exist on disk, figuring out which data needs to be read, bringing it back to you in a consistent interface, and so on and so forth. And so now, by, by doing this, the idea is to remove all of the, the rote maneuvers between you and accessing, uh, asking questions of your data. Uh, so one other thing that, uh, that we've tried to do with this is uh, actually to make it very easy to define new fields for your data. So when we run a simulation code, typically we evolve a couple different state variables. For instance, you might evolve the way the density changes, you might evolve the way uh, velocity changes, you might evolve pressure or momentum or you know, all these different things, or you might evolve the way that uh, molecular hydrogen changes uh, over the course of the simulation. As a simple example, uh, in, in my simulations, I work mostly on the formation of the first stars in the universe. Uh, the chemistry of the way that molecular hydrogen uh, forms governs almost all of that behavior. It, it changes the size of the cloud, it changes the temperature of the cloud, it changes the fragmentation characteristics, all these different things. But my, simula uh, my simulation code evolves the density of molecular hydrogen. But what I'm most interested in looking at is I'm lo interested in looking at the fraction of molecular hydrogen. And so what we want to do is we want to make it very easy to define a field that tells me the fraction of molecular hydrogen. Uh, so what we've done, and here I'm going to pull up an example here. So what we, what we provide is we actually provide a number of different uh, simple fields uh, that describe the way that, uh, the way that different operations happen. And so for instance, all of the uh, fields that exist in the simulation uh, that are color fields. So for instance, molecular hydrogen, helium, ionized hydrogen, and so on, all provide uh, fractional abundances. You can provide things like, uh, uh, we provide things like velocity magnitude. Now uh, let me, I'm having a hard time with my mouse. So for instance, velocity magnitude, what it does is it takes a bulk of velocity and then it returns the uh, the root mean square, or the, I'm sorry, the, the, the square root of the sum of the squares of the different velocities in the simulation. This is not a variable that's evolved by the, by the simulation, but it can be provided transparently in post-processing. And so, you know, by this manner, we, we provide the mechanism to instead, instead of having to go out, manually calculate all these different fields each time you want to access them, to instead uh, define them once and then from there, be able to access them as though they had been evolved by the calculation. So here's an example of how one might do this uh, for a pressure field. So you define your field, you define your gamma, 
and then you uh, multiply, multiply them all out as appropriate. Uh, scripts should be simple and clear, so very short. We can do things like uh, inside this entire script, uh, we describe a sphere that's 1,000 AU, and we say that we want the average molecular hydrogen fraction as a function of density and temperature. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, molecular hydrogen fraction is a derived field. It's not evolved by the calculation, but instead defined uh, in functional form uh, by your code, by, by YT. And so what, it do, what the code does at this point is it goes out, loads in data within 1,000 AU of the most dense point in the calculation. It bins it by density and temperature, and then uh, 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 returns the average molecular hydrogen fraction in that region. You can do accumulations as well, so you can look at the, the distribution of mass, for instance. This is from my calculation. And what you can see is you can see that, yes, there are some shocking regions, and you know, there are some areas here at about 10 to the minus 7 particle, or grams per cubic centimeter that, uh, that look like they're evolving adiabatically, uh, but they're really not because there's a small amount of cooling at that time. We can provide slices, and so this is uh, a demonstration of the idea behind you know, masking out different sets of data, when you slice through a calculation at a given point, you, know, you slice through the coarsest, then the medium, and then you know, some of the finer data, what it returns to you is it returns to you only the data uh, that, is, that is relevant at each location. And you can see, uh, so for instance, this is a slice through, through a simulation, and then we overlay the grids on top of that, and you can see that what it's doing is it's calculating uh, for you all of the different uh, regions of interest in the calculation. Now we want to make it very easy to do things, and so slices is a matter of only a handful of lines of code. You load your data, and then you say that you want a slice plot along the second axis uh, of the field density at the center of the calculation that's 200 kiloparsecs on a side, and then you save it out, and it returns it to you. Now, if we wanted to zoom in, we can actually set the width at a later time to, say, 20 kiloparsecs. And then it returns to that image. And so the idea here is, once again, rather than talking about the different units on disk and so on, uh, the, different, the different locations of data, we actually only have to speak in terms that are meaningful to us as astronomers. And so you'll see here that density is even turned in grams per cubic centimeter rather than whatever code units the code evolves for purposes of you know, avoiding round-off error or, or speed or, or things like that. We can do the same thing with projections, which are really a, a, a different term for a line integral through the calculation. We can project through the calculation and calculate either averages or, uh, or the column density. And so you can see that if we project through the exact same calculation, uh, it returns to us, uh, oh, the units are, are mislabeled here, but it returns to us grams per centimeter squared because it's taking a column density through the calculation that's 20 kiloparsecs on the side. And so there are a few other things. Uh, I'm going to briefly uh, touch on oblique slices and off-axis projections. Uh, and one of, the, one of the ideas behind all of this is that you project once and you pixelize many times. And so the idea is that we take a single line integral through the calculation once and then we take that calculation, and then we fill an image buffer every time you request a new, uh, a new image. So I'm going to demonstrate that very briefly here. Uh, this calculation uh, right here is the, a, a simulation that was run on Blue Waters uh, by Brian O'Shea's PRAC. Uh, it has about 1,800 cubed cells uh, in the entire calculation. Uh, and I want to say, let me see how many grids it has. It has about 300,000 grids. Uh, the simulation is 35 megaparsecs over H co-moving on a side. And uh, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty big. It's about 1.3 terabytes on disk. Earlier today, I projected this simulation on Gordon. So I took a single line integral through the entire calculation on Gordon. Uh, and now, without having to, to do anything, you know, to, to wait for it to redo the entire line integral, what I can do is I can zoom in, and I can pan around, and I can uh, examine it in all these different areas, and I can see it from, uh, you know, without, with, uh, without any time to refresh. So I'm going to pop up a panable map. And so this is the same calculation. And what it's doing is, on the fly, as I zoom in, it's recalculating the images that should be displayed, and then it's returning these to the web browser.
And so once again, the idea is we want to avoid having to think about this stuff. We want to just ask questions of the data. And so the fastest way to do that is to start identifying common routines and to pull them out. And so that's, what, uh, that, that's uh, how projections work, I suppose. And so with this, with this technique, what we can do is we can provide an ex exploratory mechanism of, of looking at large-scale simulations. We can provide a quantitative mechanism of looking through large-scale simulations. And really, uh, the thing that's missing from what I've talked about so far is the idea of doing this very quickly. Uh, what we really want to do is we want to examine the largest data sets available as fast as possible. And so uh, YT uses several different mechanisms of parallelism. Uh, both from a technical standpoint and also from a philosophical standpoint. Uh, from a technical standpoint, YT is parallelized with uh, multi-level MPI communication, which means that you can have a very large domain of processors, say, you know, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, into which you apply a new level of parallelism where those processors act as a, an independent communicator on to, uh, inside of that. And this can be nested as deeply as MPI will allow. Additionally, it can take, uh, it can have task queues such that there's dynamic load balancing of tasks between processors. Uh, on top of this base level of technical parallelism, there are both embarrassingly parallel and spatially decomposed problems uh, for simulation data sets. So as an example of embarrassingly parallel, these are, these are problems that are decomposed either by load or by I.O. characteristics. If I very large simulation, such as that blue water simulation that I wanted to look at, uh, and find out the average density and temperature. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, if I wanted to see the average temperature as a function of density, that would be an embarrassingly parallel problem. It doesn't matter which section of the, the, the domain goes to which processor, because at the end, they will each, ex uh, they will perform a reduction step that figures out the final values. Uh, however, a spatially decomposed problem would be something like halo finding. That's where each processor needs to know something about the spatial location of its particles. When you're calculating an average, you can have a grid, you know, a parcel of fluid over here and a parcel of fluid over here, and they can interact with each other very nicely. But when you're calculating halos, you need to have some sort of information about where your halos are uh, positioned with respect to all of the other halos. So we provide, uh, you know, mechanisms for iter for uh, for what, what amounts to essentially data flow operations for both embarrassingly parallel and spatially decomposed problems. Uh, for embarrassingly parallel problems, we can do things like quantities, such as angular momentum vectors, you know, total quantities in the calculation, profiles, slices, projections, volume renderings. And for spatial decomposition, we're uh, essentially down to just halo finding at this time. Uh, that's the only remaining spatially decomposed problem uh, in YT. We see somewhat good scaling. These numbers uh, have actually improved somewhat since I made this figure. This figure was made uh, a little while ago. Uh, the numbers have both improved at the high end here. Uh, this is for uh, conducting a projection. We can actually, we now scale up to about 1,000 processors before we see a turnoff. Um, and it's also come down in total time by about an order of magnitude. So the time that it took to, to project a, a Blue Waters type simulation uh, actually has improved substantially since this, this figure was made. But we see linear scaling up to about the number of processors you would expect in a typical visualization cluster of about 1,000. For calculating uh, profiling, we actually see better uh, scaling because it's an embarrassingly parallel problem, uh, whereas this one requires a, a small uh, final, conver uh, final collection step at the very end. So here's profiling in 1D and 2D. Um, they actually scale uh, in my tests up to about 2,000 processors. Uh, we, you know, provide multi-level parallelism for dynamic work groups, communicators, subgroups, and task queues. And again, what I want to emphasize is that with multi-level parallelism, what you can do is you can provide scaling beyond, you can provide super scaling beyond the ability of any given set of processors to operate on a single task. So for instance, uh, this set of, let's say, let's say that you had a task that flattened out at about a thousand processors you could spawn up uh, 10,000 processors and then execute the same task uh, 10, on 10 different data sets uh, inside that set of processors. Um, 
Moving on, I, I wanted to take just a moment to talk about volume rendering, uh, simply because volume rendering is one of the, the, the most fun things you can do with data. Um, and so volume rendering is designed around integrating through, through a single volume. So when you have a, a large grid data set or something like that, you could imagine taking a plane of rays at one end of the grid data set and integrating them following the radiative transfer equation all the way through the entire data set. So this is an old widget we used to use to come up with transfer functions. You can see here's some giant molecular cloud data set from David Collins. Uh, and then what we do is we uh, discretize the path length as it, a ray moves across a grid and then we integrate the absorption and the emission coefficients through that data set. And this has a side effect, visualizations. This is uh, a visualization of the L7 light cone uh, data set from, from the LCA. Uh, but it's designed to be very simple and easy to use, very straightforward. And so it's, ter it's uh, described in terms that may be familiar. So this, for example, is a Planck transfer function. So the idea of the Planck transfer function is that you take the temperature in your calculation you use that to govern the color that gas emits at, and then you use the density to govern both uh, how much uh, of different wavelengths is absorbed between you, or, or how much is absorbed between you and the viewpoint, and also the uh, magnitude of the emission from each fluid parcel. And so a script like this uh, can be run in parallel, um, and will go out. It will set the the dirt, uh, over which the ray is integrated uh, to one one one. It sets the width to be 100 megaparsecs, and then it says I want 1024 pixels on a side, uh, and then it integrates through. And so you get something like this. This is actually not 100 megaparsecs, uh, and it doesn't look like quite much uh, here, but these are dwarf galaxies forming uh, inside a simulation volume where the color and the uh, brightness are governed by the temperature and the density, and the absorption is governed also by the density of, you know, with some heuristic applied for, for uh, scattering. And you can do this on, on larger scales as well. This is a simulation by John Wise, uh, you know, where the same thing has been applied. But we can also do, uh, for instance, the traditional isocontour volume rendering. And so this is, uh, you'll note that, that this is a, a galaxy cluster simulation by Sam Skillman, where what he's done is he's identified different isocontours and density that he wanted to highlight, uh, and then applied colors to those. Uh, and so the reason that, that this is interesting, I think, is that what you can do is you can use the same code that you used to conduct your quantitative analysis to guide your scientific visualization. So what I've done uh, in, my, in my personal research is I've actually gone out, I've looked at where chemical instabilities arise in, in population three stars, and then by using carefully chosen isocontours, I can highlight the way that the cloud's morphology changes during its collapse uh, based on that. One fun thing is that you'll note that this is round. Uh, YT provides a fisheye renderer, uh, and we, uh, at a workshop in, in January, we actually had fisheye renderings on the Adler Planetarium Dome. Uh, so using the same simulation code that you uh, are using, to, that you could use to analyze your data, you can also produce uh, planetarium visualizations. Uh, now, I wanted to, to very briefly show uh, one that was made. Uh, this is going to be in a, this is going to be at the Adler. Um, I was super honored to be able to provide this visualization. This is one of my simulations of a POP3 star, and then it zooms out. And so uh, the reason that I, that I show this is because this was, again, all done within the same scientific environment uh, that, that was used in the publication of the paper that uh, described this calculation. So I'm going to skip forward. It just zooms out. Um, and then John Wise provided this visualization, also using uh, YT, of a star, uh, of a simulation in Enzo, where the star ignites, it ionizes its region, and then it explodes. And you can actually see the, the supernova uh, remnant expanding there. You can see tiny little clumps uh, in the outer regions, like little tadpoles. This is an Enzo simulation visualized with YT. Uh, and in fact, one uh, interesting thing is that uh, all of the parameter files and the source code to generate every step of this entire calculation are available uh, online. So the colors uh, are also the Planck transfer function in this one. And so uh, here, let me, let me go forward and then I'll, I'll zoom. And so the blue represents hot, you know, red represents cold, and then there's some heuristic for scattering applied. 
So when it looks, so if we were to rotate this, you would see as you were looking through higher column density, you would see it attenuated somewhat. Hmm. Oh no. That works. Ah, there we go. Okay, so let me go back here. So canned analysis tasks. So what would, you know, this, this whole framework, you know, that I've described for you so far is essentially a mechanism of abstracting all of the mechanics of asking questions of your data. However, on top of that, we've tried to build a number of different interesting canned analysis tasks that you can use to uh, examine your data in more detail and to apply astrophysically specific, astrophysics specific analysis to them. Uh, so among these different things, I'm just going to highlight that uh, the absorption spectrum, the level sets, uh, and the, uh, the, the star analysis, which are some of my, my favorite ones. Uh, we do provide halo finding, but uh, more than that, we also provide an easy way to load in halos that you, that you know about already. Uh, so it, you don't have to use the YT halo finder in order to take advantage of things like examining, you know, baryonic quantities and so on uh, in those halos. Um, so level sets are one of the things that I think are most fun. And this is identifying topologically connected sets uh, inside YT. This has been used for star formation calculations where you cross-correlate uh, cells across uh, different refinement regions and you can analyze them as a conceptual object. So instead of having a sphere, what you have is you have an isocontour at some density. Uh, there's synthetic spectra using uh, BCO3. Uh, we have yet to implement the F, F, P, S, S. We have yet to implement Charlie Conroy's mechanism for generating uh, population synthesis, but we do provide synthetic spectra based on population synthesis from star particles that uh, exist inside your calculation. Uh, Two-point functions, so correlation of uh, for instance, in turbulence data sets, uh, we can provide correlate, it provides correlation functions uh, between different regions in the simulation. Uh, and then also three halo finders. Uh, standard hop, uh, essentially a basic port of, of the original hop code, a simple friends of friends, a parallel hop, which was developed here at, at uh, UCSD by Stephen Scorey, and then also beta integration of the Rockstar halo finder, uh, which is driven also largely by Chris Moody. Um, you know, there's documentation on the website, uh, and since we're talking about, you know, big data, uh, I wanted to very briefly talk about co-scheduled and in-situ visualization. And uh, so this is a fire hydrant that I inexplicably found on a hike near my house in Michigan. And the reason that I chose this particular picture was because the idea, as, as Alex and Joel have both mentioned, is that there's this uh, fire hose of data that we can only sip from if we look only at the data that has been processed after the simulation has been done. Um, what you want to do is you want to take your simulation code and you want to have access to it during the course of the simulation running. Uh, so there are a couple different ways to do this. Uh, the way that we have currently implemented having a single conceptual process space. Uh, so this is the way that it works in Enzo, for instance, is there's an Enzo process that links at compile time against YT and then during the course of the simulation, uh, at fixed points in the calculation, it constructs thin in-memory wrappers around, the, provides those to YT, YT does its thing, and then comes back. Uh, there are more advanced mechanisms, uh, or I'm sorry, so let me briefly show just results of this. So on the, this is uh, from a simulation by Smith, uh, where he's looking at the way that gas changes phases in the uh, warm hot interstellar, uh, I'm sorry, the warm hot intergalactic medium, uh, and then what it's doing is uh, on the left are the, diff the, uh, the data points when he was running only from looking at the data after it had been written to disk. And then on the right is when he hooked it up to the fire hose, as it were, and started looking at every single cycle. He got a two orders of magnitude more data out and was able to perform much more complex correlations of the way that the phase of the, the whim changed uh, during the course of, of cosmic time. There's another method where, uh, which 
we're exploring right now where you launch a series of MPI processes uh, which represent the simulation. You launch a second series of MPI processes and then using MPI2's intercom standard, you can actually hook them up dynamically during the course of the simulation. And so that provides better fault tolerance and it also means that as your simulation progresses, uh, you, can, you don't have to stop and wait for the analysis processes to finish. There are other methods of doing this as well, uh, but this is, this is our, our second foray into in situ visualization. Uh, for the, the blue water simulations that I mentioned uh, a little while ago, uh, I, may, uh, I said that, that each data dump on disk was 1.3 terabytes. Um, we were only able to save, uh, I want to say, maybe 10 data dumps from each calculation. However, uh, we, because we, you know, we ran 20-some we ran calculations, uh, and so we were only able to save 10 from each, but we were able to save the full results of the YT in situ analysis which provides 400 frames for each of those 20 calculations of full adaptive projections. And so this projection that I showed you um, uh, here, you know, this, this type of projection was saved at every single cycle in the, the simulation. And so we have 400 frames of this. Uh, I, was, I tried really hard, but I was unable to uh, come up with a time slider in time for, for this conference. But uh, you know we're we're working on making those uh, you know more more accessible, and so let me uh, hope it doesn't ah there we go. Uh, so I want to very briefly talk about how YT is developed because this impacts uh, all of you here. Uh, it's developed as a team effort. Uh, there's code review on nearly every single change set. Once in a while uh, we have hot fixes to bugs that don't get reviewed, but uh, nearly every change set gets reviewed through pull requests. Uh, we have, it's a very forky development. Uh, so we develop on Bitbucket uh, using Mercurial and there are currently 45 extant forks that, uh, of the code that you know, people issue pull requests and they say I've made a change, I want this to come back in. Uh, and everything uh, comes in the box in order to develop this. When you get YT you also get not only a full uh, environment for, for you know, developing on it, but you also get instructions on how to develop YT and contribute changes back upstream. Uh, we do answer as well as integration tests every 30 minutes uh, if there are new change sets. Uh, and it's about 80,000 lines of code that's actually gone up since we, we rewrote all the JavaScript. Uh, it's mostly Python, Cython, and C. Cython is a Python-like dialect that includes things like static annotation of variables so that you can, you know, you can compile them to C code. Uh, but it also includes OpenMP primitives in recent versions, which we now use uh, in our volume renderer. Um, there are about 20 contributors. That number is, you know, in flux, depending on how you view it. There are about 150 people on the mailing list, but I, I estimate there are only about 60 users. And we have contributors from over a dozen institutions. Uh, this is a punch card of when commits mostly happen on YT. Um, you can see that it mostly happens between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. local time, but there are also a number of commits uh, late at night, and include even including some isolated commits Sunday morning at 4 a.m. And I'm not really sure who was doing that particular commit, um, but, uh, you know. Um, so I've shown you most of the, the GUI, uh, but it comes with a GUI in recent versions uh, that is designed for reproducibility. So you've seen that uh, what I've done here is I've been doing a whole bunch of I've been doing a whole bunch of different panning and zooming uh, when I've been doing, you know, zoom in 2x and then I, I pan to one side and so on. Uh, and what, one, one thing that comes in, that comes in to be a problem when you're doing things with a GUI is reproducibility. And so what we actually do is uh, we record every single script, every single command that gets executed uh, inside there and you can go and you can look at it you can see everything that YT did during the course of my, my interaction with the GUI. And so you could run that script, uh, you know, as a later time in order to reproduce a plot that you've made. Um, you know, there are a couple other things in there I don't need to, to go into detail on. Uh, we have also recently added a 3D widget to the GUI. One of the problems with any GUI anywhere uh, when you're dealing with supercomputer centers is that it's a gigantic pain to get native toolkits set up in order to do X11 forwarding and so on. So we went with a fully web GUI uh, so that you could just tunnel that over an SSH port. This means that you can run it at any institution that you have SSH access to on that data. Um, with recent advances in HTML, we, you can now do uh, 
3D widgets, and so this is actually a 3D, uh, this is a static image, I can't click and drag on it, uh, but you can actually do 3D, anal uh, 3D uh, exploration of your data from the web browser. It's somewhat limited as of right now, uh, but it has no dependencies, and it all comes right there in the box. Uh, and we're hoping to add volume rendering and volume rendering widgets to it as well. Um, I've, here, here, are, here is a list of the contributors to YT, because you know, I've, I've presented a whole bunch up here, and I don't want you to get the impression that I'm the only one working on it, because I'm not. We have you know, nearly 30 people that have contributed, and this is only the list of people who have committed to the repository. There have been conversations with people, funding, assistance, all these different things uh, that don't make it onto this list. Uh, but I would like to highlight you know, Mike Norman and Joel Premack and, and, and a number of different people that, that have really helped out uh, over the course of time. Uh, and I've put in bold the people that uh, have contributed or who have committed more than, more than 100 times to the repository. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, we have two people on this list here right now, uh, Casper and, and Chris. Um, if you want to get started with YT, you can go to the website. I've also created a smaller website uh, uh, for the ISAC uh, program, uh, slash ISAC 2012. Um, and that's the end of the presentation, uh, but let me show you what is on that ISAC website. Uh, it has links to uh, the home page, the documentation, uh, as well as uh, in 2012, in January of this year, we held a workshop at the ASC or at the Flash Center in Chicago, uh, and for this workshop, we had a number of you know we had sampled data. We also had a number of talks uh, where we we had slides uh, from each talk, repositories of code, and if you are so inclined, you can even watch you know videos. We have about ten and a half hours of uh, of inf of, doc of of presentations that have been recorded in full HD. Um, that you can watch, uh, as well as the sample data. Additionally, I've already loaded data onto Gordon. Um, there's medium data, uh, which is in the sample data directory, which also includes some small data. But if I put small dash medium data, it, it made the text look funny. So I just called it medium data, uh, as well as large data. I would recommend you not do too much with the large data until um, you know we've, we've talked about the parallelism tomorrow afternoon. But the medium data, you should feel free to have at. Um, and I'm going to continue updating this, including you know uh, little bits of information about how to launch the GUI and so on. Um, and I want to just end by saying uh, thank you very much to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present. Uh, and I hope that uh, you know tomorrow during the hands-on and also on Wednesday we can talk about fun questions to answer uh, of your data. So thank you. For particle-based codes, that's uh, well. So Gadget is an interesting thing because Gadget isn't really one code. Gadget's a lot of codes that a lot of people have different I/O formats for. So we have basic support for the we have basic but very incomplete support for the Owl's HDF5 data format for Gadget. Um, it's not we you can't analyze the baryonic quantities yet. And the code is available online, but I'm, it's, not, it's not really ready yet. Um, for other particle-based data sets, it's still in progress. That's one of my goals for this week is actually to push forward on that, push forward on that, and also to improve the octree support. So it's not really production level yet. No. Uh, so, the basic idea is, well, we. Uh, so the basic idea is that you set up a set of I/O nodes, and then we've got a message passing interface that goes back and forth for querying, and then applying the SPH kernel onto them uh, in an adaptive uh, method. So actually, you probably have some good ideas about this. We should chat later. I guess I. Yours truly. Sorry? Uh, well, all right. So uh, there was uh, this book by Neil Stevenson uh, from 1992 called Snow Crash. Uh, and in this book, there's a character called en uh, Uncle Enzo. And Uncle Enzo has a helper. Uh, well, not really a helper. She's the 
protagonist. She's one of the protagonists, uh, the only one whose last name isn't protagonist. And uh, his his assistant YT, you know, helps him out and basically does all all the stuff that he needs done. And so, since I started writing it to work with the code Enzo, and I was a big Neil Stevenson fan, it all sort of came together very nicely. Originally, it was called Raven when all it did was slice the data, but that might be a spoiler alert for the end of the book. <laughs> Well, so that's, that's a, a very good question. Um, and it's actually something that we have struggled with in the past, is when things that weren't really production level were suggested for inclusion into YT. And so uh, we, do, we manage this all through, through pull requests. And so I've pulled up here a list. We don't have any open pull requests right now, but I've pulled up here a list of, of pull requests for the code base. Let me see if I can find a particularly contentious one. Um, and what, what we do is uh, we actually have updates to the pull requests and comments. Uh, eyes get, uh, and then you know, the pull requests get updated until they are ready to be uh, accepted. If we decide that it's not something that's suitable for inclusion, we actually just reject the pull request. Usually that, uh, you know, we, we talk that over with the, with the submitter and so on. But I guess one, an interesting side question to that is how do you manage the idea of there being a core set of functionality? which probably doesn't need to change, and then also additional things. And so what we've done is uh, we, we actually have what's called the YT Hub. Um, and if you, uh, I would recommend you not go to this, where we just switched over to DNS last week, and we've had some problems with spammers. But uh, we have a mechanism inside, uh, inside YT that uh, what it will do is if you run it inside a directory that contains scripts, uh, what it does is it initializes a Mercurial repository, creates that repository on Bitbucket, gets you a user on Bitbucket if you need one, uploads that repository, and then submits it to uh, the project hub. And so, for instance, um, Sam Skillman has created this uh, Enhance Your Renderings project. And what it does is, you know, it, it enhances your volume renderings. And so he then submits it to the hub. And so in this mechanism, you know, it, it stays a little distinct from the core YT, but we still provide a mechanism for both uh, sharing projects, you know, like sub-projects, little scripts and so on, uh, with the broader community without necessarily including them in the, the, the main part of YT. Um, what, we're, what I'm working on uh, with respect to this right now, uh, you know, is, is to, to provide a command line mechanism. So it, it's command line for uploading the projects. I'm trying to provide right now a command line mechanism for querying and downloading. Everything gets accepted to this. Oh, into into the main code base. Um, well, so typically I'm the person that that looks at all of the changes, um, but you can see uh, they can be accepted by uh, anyone who is a member of the core team, basically. So we have a there's a core team responsibility on Bitbucket. And uh, those are essentially decided on an ad hoc basis. Uh, it's, I think it's five people right now. Um, we don't have in place a rigorous method of determining division of responsibilities or uh, determining, um, uh, determining membership in different groups. Uh, for the most part, you know, we, haven't, we haven't yet grown to that, that level yet. I know that the toolkits like uh, the Einstein toolkit have a very rigorous method of community governance, and we actually don't have a clear-cut mechanism of community governance yet, although uh, community management and community growth are things that, that I think are, are some of the most important aspects of trying to, to grow a, a project like this. Um, we, don't, we don't currently have, like I said, you know, a checklist that you know, if you commit this many times, you get in, and so on like that. It's, on some level, um, we have it's it's a relatively active uh, discussion community. Let me see if I can pull this up. And so uh, here, let me. So we we have you know relatively active mailing lists, and almost everything that needs to get discussed, uh, you know, gets discussed on one of the mailing lists. Uh, 
Oh, I think I lost my internet. Well, yeah, we have you know relatively active discussion of all these different things. And I think that it, it so far has succeeded, and I don't think that we have gotten to the point where, um, where we, we are straining at the bounds of our, our ad hoc de, uh, de facto community governance model. Well, so that actually is, is one of the, the goals of, of YT, and we are still working to get there. We have not done detailed, there has not been a cross-code comparison paper yet published that uses YT as its, as its principal analysis method. But that is where we, that is where we are aiming and positioning ourselves. Um, and I hope that we can get there sometime soon. There's this, uh, the conference that Joel mentioned uh, coming up soon, and, and hopefully we'll be ready at that time to, to serve that role. But I think that's an extremely interesting and deep question. Uh, but I wish I had a. But I wish I could just say yes. We've we've addressed that. But we are still working to that point. Um, there have been small steps taken in that direction with uh, turbulence and star formation projects, but nothing has made it into the published literature yet. Um, from the from the aspect of reproducibility, one of the goals is that you should only have to change the name of your. I'm sorry. For the aspect of cross code comparison. One of the goals uh, is that you should only have to change the name of your output in order to run the same script on two different codes. And I think we have, uh, I think that has been successful. We provide translation tables between different field names uh, that exist in say, say for instance, flash code calls the density field D-E-N-S all lowercase, whereas Enzo uh, would call it density with a capital D. You know, Orion actually, I believe, calls it row. Uh, we, we provide translation tables internally that, that do that. And so you could run the same script on an Orion data set and an Enzo and a Flash, and we have done that. Uh, but the bigger problem for actually conducting the comparison has been the initial conditions. Um, from the aspect of reproducibility, uh, YT has been very heavily script and API focused. And so we want to provide, you know, that I think is a good basis for conducting reproducible research, uh, you know, ensuring that you have the same, same commands executed and still ensuring that there's nothing, no hidden magic going on behind the scenes. Well, thank you. Oh, thank you very much.